I'm Laura Broderick from the Building Centre, um, hosting today's session. Um, so delighted you could all join this lunchtime and share the, the conversation today between uh, Studio Partington, Energy Sprong and Melius Holmes, all about an example of industrialised retrofit and social rent homes. So thank you for joining. Um, as I say, we've got a few more attendees just logging in to hear the session and hear from our speakers. Um, just to set the scene, um, this is part of our New Homes and New Ways exhibition and event series, um, our second webinar. Um, I hope you can join us. Come and visit the exhibition at the Building Centre on Store Street in central London. Um, we're running the exhibition all about collaboration and innovation through modern methods of construction in partnership with the housing festival through till the 21st of February. So lots to come and see in the exhibition space and um, lots to attend by way of events, obviously webinars like today um, that you're part of, but future webinars, we've got a session next Tuesday about steel framing and new homes. So look out for that one and check out our website for that. We also have two big event days as a New Homes in New Ways Summit on the 12th and 13th of February, and tickets are being released this week for those. So lots for you to engage in. Um, I hope to kind of see you at all those events. Um, but for today's session, I'm really, really delighted that we're going to have um, a case study from a collaborative team here. Um, so this is very much about multiple voices, sharing experiences, sharing ways of coming together to look at how do we improve social rent homes, how do we tackle our uh, housing crisis in new and innovative ways, as well as thinking about the decarbonisation piece and retrofit. Um, so we'll be hearing about how healthy, warm, energy efficient and characterful homes were created in Nottingham. Um, so yeah, really excited to have this session. Um, as I say, I am not speaking about the case study, I'm going to be handing over to the, the project team, to Suzanne and John and Robert to share. Um, but just so you kind of know about the format of how we're doing this, um, we've got about 30 minutes of them presenting and they'll be sharing slides and talking you through the case study from Nottingham. Um, we'll then have a Q&A with you as our audience. I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Suzanne um, to introduce the actual case study and the presentation today. So thank you everyone for attending. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Hi there. Hopefully everyone can see the screen share now. Um, I'm Suzanne. I'm going to be speaking alongside um, friends John and Robert, who are collaborators on the Nottingham 2050 Homes project, where over 200 homes have been retrofitted for Nottingham City Council. We're speaking today because, our, as Laura mentioned, our Nottingham project is a case study in the New Homes in New Ways exhibition. Um, it's one of the solutions, some of the many great solutions you can go and see, um, which is set against the temporary accommodation crisis shown here in um, shelter and crisis installation. Um, I think our case study is an unusual or perhaps even unique one in the exhibition um, as we're using advanced MMC to retrofit existing homes while residents stay at home. This introductory slide um, summarizes some of the key achievements of our project, which we'll obviously go into in more detail through this presentation. Um, and it's so some of the unique aspects are that it follows the energy sprung approach, um, which is outcome led um, with per performance ensured by um, post completion monitoring. So now I'm just going to the next slide, we're going to show a one minute video. Um, it's a shortened version of the video that's on display in the exhibition where we'll hear from um, Robert, who is going to be speaking later. It's a summary video. And then I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to talk about introduce himself and talk about the energy sprung approach. The UK has some of the poorest quality, leakiest homes across Europe. We have a real housing crisis with the number of houses being built far short of what's required to meet demand. We've lost a lot of the core trades and skills over the last few decades and that means that we've got a real challenge in terms of building with traditional methods. The regulations and standards in the UK for housing fall far short of what's required to meet the challenge around climate emergency.
The use of off-site manufacture and allows us to take the traditional activity away from site and build the key major components in a factory environment. And we're the first organisation in the UK to actually apply off-site manufacture for retrofit. The vision for Melius Homes is to see a radically different construction and housing sector. One that puts people and places and planet at the heart of the decisions that we make. And we're playing our part by delivering higher quality, higher performance, new homes and retrofit. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm John Warren from Energy Sprong. I'm uh, one of the, uh, an engineer working at Energy Sprong, uh, and I, I've been there for the last uh, eight years. This project uh, near the start of that that journey. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to talk a, a little bit about about that uh, development of the Energy Sprong concept in the UK and uh, and where it came from and, and and where we're kind of going next. So. Um, before uh, I do, just on the next slide, I was going to talk uh, a little bit about Energy Sprong and its mission. So we are a, a not-for-profit uh, catalyst, essentially. So we we don't do any of the the, the hard work that Melius Homes and Studio Partington do, but um, we're very much there um, to um, uh, deliver our mission to find those to deliver comfortable, affordable, desirable homes. That meet those 2050 standards. So beginning with the end in mind, um, uh, and we we began um, uh, the energy strong movement began uh, as you might guess from the name in the Netherlands in, in 2010, uh, and and we had a, a, a several European funding streams to kind of uh, build that up, uh, test the ecosystem for what was needed to de deliver retrofits like they were delivering in, in the Netherlands at the time, uh, and then pilot that and demonstrate that in the UK and really inspire that market. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of us. Uh, I think on, on the next slide, we've got this kind of pictorial journey about um, um, where it all started. So um, by 2015 in the Netherlands, um, we were starting to see some um, uh, larger uh, street by street projects. Um, of, of a full metro, uh, uh, net zero retrofit in one step. We were starting to see the beginning of um, uh, some industrialization, so components being built uh, in factories and then shipped to site. Um, uh, so uh, around that point, um, uh, a, a bus was put together and we did a tour of the Netherlands for interested people uh, or people in the UK that wanted to kind of lift the the ambition level of, of, of retrofit and, and start that industrialization journey. Um, so in the middle there, you can see uh, the project we're talking about today, um, uh, delivered by Studio Partington and Mulis Homes. Um, and um, that's part, I think there's 140 homes completed now as part of that scheme. Uh, and today there's, there's circa 400 homes completed by Energy Sprong uh, in, in the whole of the UK, including the one down at the bottom there um, with the yellow finish um, down in the London borough of Sutton. And you can see um, uh, in that particular one down, down below, uh, we've got some energy modules fitted out um, uh, outside the home, which contain a heat pump and uh, all of the low carbon equipment. Um, to the right, again, we, we're now seeing the beginnings of some industrialization activity in the UK through Melius and others, um, uh, and a, a journey that we very much hope to, to continue. Okay, on the next slide is a bit more about our vision and how things have evolved, um, evolved for us over the last few years. Um, so of course, in the top right, um, we're absolutely focused um, on, on, on making sure that we have um, warm, sustainable, desirable homes that um, uh, uh, suit our tenants uh, and um, uh, work today as well as in the future. Uh, and absolutely setting that, that really um, uh, desirable standard that we need not just for the next few years, but we'll still be doing what, what they need to do for climate change and for 2050. Um, in the top left, of course, we've got industrialization, and that's what we're talking about today, but um, uh, we've uh, been on quite a journey in terms of uh, collaborating uh, with lots of parts of the supply chain, bringing together the people we need to solve the barriers, um, and build that ecosystem that industrialization requires where there's more certainty 
about what particular homes um, uh, need to be retrofitted in, in, with what particular components and the demand levels for those components. Uh, and also, um, you know, what the pipeline could look like in terms of um, uh, which homes could go first into um, uh, a pipeline of uh, industrialized uh, retrofitted homes. So that's our really, really our ambition is to, to, to make that, um, uh, the, the industrialized part of that a thriving uh, and collaborative industry. Of course, in, in the bottom left there, it's not going to scale up without a robust, robust business case. So we've been absolutely working uh, along with um, uh, these uh, real world projects to say, you know, what is the true performance? What, what, is, what are the costs? What are those costs going to look like as uh, things scale up? So, uh, and alongside that, growing these projects beyond the balance sheets of uh, uh, social landlords and seeing what the role is for finance, uh, public finance or private finance to kind of make sure that there's the, the, the funding to, to scale up. Uh, and finally, that, that bottom right one on um, uh, real world performance. Um, uh, uh, I think what sets any of these books strong apart is that, uh, that real outcome focus. So most of our homes, or nearly all of our homes, have monitoring systems in them where we've been able to go back to that home and in many cases now for a number of years and, and check that that performance is, is, is durable and that it's lasting. And um, we're seeing some really good results um, uh, for, uh, for the projects and for tenants uh, that have, have gone through quite a turbulent time in terms of uh, uh, energy price rises and, uh, and volatility. Um, and we're absolutely convinced that, um, you know, that a, a higher level of insulation and a package of measures is, is um, going to be the, the, the right solution for, for many homes going forward in terms of making sure that we can make a, a just transition and, 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 and help the energy system make that transition uh, that it needs to. Okay, on the, on the next slide, we've uh, got a couple of examples of how we're starting to scale up what we've learned and put that into practice. Um, the first project on the left there, we're, we're running a, uh, a Desnes funded heat pump ready project where we're, we're looking at four particular archetypes, non-traditional archetypes, which have typically been quite tricky to retrofit and deliver the outcomes that tenants need. A, a lot of homes that haven't uh, been able to accept the, the traditional measures that uh, we've seen in traditional programs um, and uh, in total, they number over 175,000. Uh, and we're uh, looking in detail, uh, doing two more pilots uh, and gathering all the data from, from those and the other schemes that we've delivered to produce some um, almost like blueprints or design codes about um, what the particular trade-offs trade might be, costs might be, performance might be uh, for those homes. Um, so hopefully the outcome is a, um, a like a very clear steer and um, a, a, an option, uh, different options for a, a large chunk of our uh, our UK housing stock that we can we can take forward at scale and bring in those industrialised approaches. Uh, the next two points are about another project we're running with uh, funded by Innovate UK called uh, Transformer. Um, and that's really about, again, pushing that ecosystem around retrofit to make sure that we've got all the things we need to, to scale that up. So whether that's a, a, a good data system where we, we know where the homes are, we know the status of the homes, and we know what sort of component packs might fit to those homes, um, looking at what um, an equitable model might be for progressing uh, retrofit, um, moving away perhaps from the tr traditional contractor models to something a bit more collaborative and um, uh, and, and high performance uh, and efficient. Um, and yeah, really building uh, the finance platform, the insurance platforms that we need uh, to, um, to make sure that that scales up effectively. And, and, and essentially we will be, by the end of that project, testing a platform for, that with data in there for 300,000 homes uh, uh, with the capacity to scale up to a million a year, which is kind of the, the rate that we need to achieve to um, hit climate change in 2050 goals. Okay, that's uh, that's it. Final slide uh, from me, just with our, uh, my details. Um, it's, um, yeah, just to stress, we are very much a, a catalyst organization and yeah, this wouldn't happen without the likes of um, uh, Studio Partners and Emilius Nottingham City Homes and all of the other 
designers, um, manufacturers and landlords that we that we work with. Um, so high time that I hand this uh, back over to, uh, to Suzanne. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm now going to go through um, the little bit more detail introducing our Nottingham project. So these are the um, the existing homes, although they're well located and had a great community. Um, they're non-traditional William Moss council properties. They're concrete crosswall construction and then essentially with kind of timber shed in between them. They were absolutely freezing and particularly inefficient with garages on the ground floor, three story split roof design. And tenants said the external walls felt as if they uh, moved when they lent on them. Energy sprung approach is particularly appropriate for these kind of repeated house types. So these terraced houses, which are adjacent to bungalows and then two storey low rise flats are found across Nottingham in areas developed after the war. And also when substantial maintenance and expenditure is on the horizon. So you can see um, the, the timber cladding was in poor condition. And then it's not very easy to see from these pictures, but it's kind of copper roof cladding that was totally failed. Um, the solution to these homes, which you can see on the right hand side of the page and in our diagram to the bottom, is to pioneer, um, so this was the first Energy Sprung project in the UK, the um, Energy Sprung People Focused Retrofit Standard and also MMC or Industrialised Construction for Retrofit. As John has already mentioned, it's a strikingly collaborative project. The client, Nottingham City Homes, began with a competitive dialogue tender process, which included residents in the procurement decision. And so engagement um, is key to the approach, um, it's putting people first. Um, the retrofit is discussed in, so this is an example drawing from one of those early consultations, which happened even during the, the tendering of the project. The retrofit is discussed in tangible terms of being more comfortable or being able to heat your home for residents in fuel poverty and paying the same or less than as before the retrofit. Um, we were able to establish a wish list with the, um, the residents of the pilot project um, with additional um, fairly low cost items such as light tubes making stairs brighter, outside taps for watering plants and a doorbell, which were able to completely fulfill through the project, kind of knowing that, you know, residents are the best um, at knowing exactly what they would like and need. And it's always different in, in different cases. Um, this, so the energy sprung approach is a holistic whole house and outcome led retrofit approach, which brings forward capital investment and maintenance, which can be recovered over time through a comfort plan paid by residents, um, which can also be invested in more residents. The key thing is that residents pay no more for a comfortable home that they can afford to heat. The homes are super insulated, PV is maximized and gas is removed. And then the, as I said before, the requirements are holistic. So it also covers ventilation, overheating, curb appeal and post completion monitoring in every home. So these um, early sketches and then um, details show, show the whole project. So the homes have been entirely overclad. It's like putting a new house over the top of an old one with prefabricated timber frame panels, which include external finishes, windows and doors and sit on new foundations. Um, we needed the panels because you can't fix into those flimsy timber shed walls in this non-traditional archetype. Um, the initial sketches, slightly fuzzy there to the left, but they show the kind of thinking that needs to happen, um, like how to support those facade panels. The fact if we're thickening the facade, we'd need to extend the roof eaves. These were houses that were all built at one time, so they actually shared drainage pipes. So where we've got, as we always find with retrofit projects, um, privately owned homes, um, you've got to think about how to continue to drain those roofs. Um, So that, I guess that, that's always one of a particular challenge, like how to sit next to a home that's not being improved. And across the UK, we have a kind of patchy tenure in stock as a legacy of the right to buy scheme. OK, so um, apologies for the kind of numbers slide. <laughs> Rob thought you'd want to see it. So but this is what is the point it's getting across is the kind of energy modelling that we do. This is actually from a, a a different project that we we're working together on at the minute. But what we do is we model like what if scenarios and work through that to find the sweet spot of cost. And that's not just capital costs, but also resident bills 
and maintenance costs too, performance and disruption. Um, and those performance considerations are holistic. So not just energy modeling and like chasing EPCC, for instance, but decarbonization, ventilation, um, these homes have um, humidity controlled MEV installed in them, thermal bridging, um, damp and mold risk and overheating. So we're balancing these requirements and the cost and availability of measures. And I should, sorry, I probably should have said, and that kind of what if scenario is very collaborative. We have to work very closely with Melius to be working out what, what the proposal should be. Um, these photos show um, Melis's closed timber frame panel MMC category two factory, um, which was established locally in Nottingham during the project, which Rob will tell you more about. Um, and it was established after the pilot highlighted, so this didn't exist at the beginning of the project. It was established after the pilot highlighted gaps in the supply chain. So the very first panels um, couldn't have the windows indoors in, weren't the full width of the house. Um, and again, was a collaboration. This was a collaboration too with the with the client Nottingham City Homes in terms of like where we set up the factory. Um, and the the key benefit, I'd say, of some kind of benefits on the left, but one really the key one I think here is over the project of aggregating the demand. Um, having innovation, product feedback and systemic improvement. Um, and there are also benefits to jobs, skills and training and diversity in construction. Now, my final point to make and plea to make is that retrofit um, is more than energy efficiency. It's also urban design. There's an opportunity to a kind of golden opportunity to fix urban design issues and strengthen existing communities who are experts themselves on what's needed. So in in this project here, we replaced garages onto the streets with habitable rooms and second entrances. The lighter finishes brighten the narrow, oh, sorry, brighten the narrow walkways, which are the other side of this street, which is how you access the main houses between the houses and the bungalows. And the coloured window surrounds chosen by residents give identity to each terrace and signal that the area has changed. And then my final slide just shows um, our site plan and actually some kind of landscaping interventions, which weren't fully able to be um, included because of funding, but just to really show you and kind of that how far we could go with retrofit projects and what an opportunity is to make small improvements to existing communities and um, uh, streets and urban areas. And I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to Rob. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, good afternoon, afternoon all. Uh, I'm Rob Lamb. Uh, I founded Media Homes back in 2016. After many years working in the industry and experiencing the challenges of delivering good quality outcomes and felt that really the, the shift the industry needs to make in the use of offsite solutions and focus on outcomes is, is something that we wanted to play uh, a key part in. Uh, we love sharing our experience of using off-site solutions for, for retrofit. So thank you for the opportunity to, to share some of our uh, experience and, and lessons uh, today. The, the approach that has been discussed, the energy strong approach is very much about focusing on outcomes. And, and to do that, you have to take a whole suite of, of criteria into account as we're developing solutions. As uh, has been already mentioned, the case study project is the first energy strong uh, scheme that was undertaken in uh, the UK. The pilot phase actually started back in 2017 and it's then been continued over multiple phases of work, which is important because it's allowed us to consider the lessons learned as we've progressed. It's allowed us to consider different technical solutions and different logistics approaches uh, to try and deliver the works in the, the most cost effective and least disruptive manner that we can. As Suzanne mentioned, the, the properties are non-traditional uh, concrete crosswalk properties and structurally very sound, but they were very cold, very leaky, very difficult to heat. So the tenants actually, in many cases, didn't even bother trying to heat the properties. They had one room that they were effectively living in that they tried to keep warm. Uh, so 
the biggest challenge was really the thermal comfort rather than the structural. Um, but the criteria that was set out addressed many more factors than that, including uh, the aesthetics, the, the street curb appeal, uh, indoor quality uh, of air uh, and comfort factors. So one of the, the challenges with these properties was that the front and the rear elevations were just infill timber structure. It basically very lightweight timber structure. Um, the Sorry, let me just move on. Uh, the problem with that is that it effectively doesn't allow the more typical external wall rendered insulation systems to be used. So we needed to develop a, a, a self-supporting structural solution. And so we, we looked at structural external wall panels uh, to, to meet that need. Another key reason for considering off-site manufacture is there's there's many uh, studies and documented uh, reports that uh, pick up the many examples of poor installation on retrofit and the, the unintended consequences. And achieving the right outcomes is extremely challenging using traditional methods. Even with the implementation of PAS 2035, which is a very robust approach and methodology that sets out to make sure that all the right decisions are made all the right considerations are, are taken into account um, and all the right competencies are, are in place through the whole team. Despite that process and, and adopting a very robust process of that nature, it still remains very difficult to achieve consistent quality outcomes when using on-site traditional labour methods. That can be much better achieved and much better controlled within a factory environment. Another significant challenge in achieving consistent quality standards is that we really do not have the workforce that uh, is needed uh, to meet the current needs, let alone the challenge of delivering uh, the pace of change that's needed uh, to meet our 2050 challenges. So the use of off-site manufacturers allowed us to widen our pool of talent, uh, to uh, employ individuals from a much more diverse background. And importantly, they don't need direct experience of construction or even manufacturing, and they don't need the, the trade skills that would be required to do this type of work on site. One of the biggest concerns we had when we started to consider the use of off-site manufacture for retrofit was making sure that uh, when the panels turn up on site on the back of a lorry, they actually fit and the windows and the doors are in the right place and that uh, the uh, dimensions that we've captured uh, allow us to seamlessly install those panels uh, on site using the uh, cranes that's required on the day of installation. So we actually invested quite a lot of time effort uh, considering and evolving our approach to ensuring that we could do that and that was fundamentally focused on the survey process. So we, in all cases, do very extensive surveys from the initial structural condition surveys, intrusive structural condition surveys, uh, general conditions. So we're looking at what the, uh, the general fabric is like, uh, the general internal conditions, including whether or not there's potential issues with access. Maybe you know there's, there's challenges with uh, indoor conditions sometimes with hoarding and, uh, you know, normal uh, situations that we need to be mindful of when we're developing solutions. Um, we supplement that with 3D point cloud uh, scans. So 3D scanning techniques, which allow us to generate point clouds. And all of that information is then combined to give us a, a full picture of what we're dealing with as far as the external and existing structures. The 3D scanning provides us with a di digital image of the existing building. Uh, effectively, it looks like a, a photograph, um, but it's uh, a series of, of very small dots which allow us to interrogate the features of the existing structure and, and focus in on the critical points that we're interested in. From that point, we then are able to generate 2D general arrangements which provide us with uh, the critical dimensions. 
And that then allows us to do some sense checking and, and some physical checking on site to make sure that uh, our interpretation of those scans is, is as accurate as we need to make sure that the panels then can be manufactured and fit when they turn up on site. We also generate 3D models. Uh, that's a, a key part of us being able to fully understand what the existing structures uh, look like, but it also allows us to then collaborate with the wider design team, the client team, bring in our manufacturing team's views and our installation site delivery team views when we're considering the technical solutions, when we're looking at the individual uh, details and the, the junctions and the interfaces. So the next step then is to, to consider those interfaces in detail, carefully considering all of the different aspects that we need to satisfy. Fundamentally, it's, it's about the robustness of the details, uh, about air tightness, thermal bridging, continuity, uh, fire, fire uh, continuity barriers and, and cavity barriers as such. Uh, it's about weather tightness, aesthetics, uh, structural, all of the factors that clearly need to be considered to ensure it's a robust solution. But we also need to consider how well that uh, solution can then be manufactured in an efficient and effective way as a process. And importantly, we need to consider how well we can then install that quickly and efficiently uh, in a safe way when it turns up on site. And we've had significant learning through our journey on this, where we've refined the details to make it easier and quicker to achieve some of those functions, the air tightness, for instance, and, and sealing air tightness membranes back to the existing structures. Um, it was taking us a significant amount of time based on our initial details and we honed that in and, and we, we managed to go through multiple iterations to get to a point where it was very quick and easy to achieve what we wanted to when those panels turned up on site. We've also been able through the phase in the continuous learning on the project to consider different technical solutions. So for the, tech, the structural support of the, the panels, we've used screw piles, we've used insulated concrete foundations, we've used uh, steel ledger angles, We've supported panels at the base. We've hung panels from the top. Um, it looks like my slides may have jumped forward. I don't know. Um, so, uh, can I just check what slide? Oh, you... Sorry, I was sharing them because you weren't sharing. So I was trying to help by sharing oh, them. Sorry, Do you want me to stop? Sharing? Yeah. Okay. No, I'll carry... stop and you can take over if I like. No, carry on. If. Uh... I catch up. I didn't realise I wasn't controlling it. Sorry. Um, so yeah, we're moving. If you, bear with me just a moment on this slide, and then I'll jump onto the one you're showing. So we've we've evolved our thinking in terms of the technical solutions progressively, and and that's a very much a collaborative approach to make sure that we're considering everybody's views on on you know what each particular detail may mean in terms of the process. On the next slide, one of the um, challenges is site planning logistics. Each one of these panels typically is uh, story height and the width of the elevation. So typically five to six meters wide, two to three meters high, uh, 200 odd mil, maybe to 300 mil thick. Uh, and therefore it weighs in the order of six to 700 kilos. So these panels get lifted into place with uh, mobile craneage. So the very nature of retrofit within typically dense urban, uh, rural areas, uh, means that the planning and the coordination, the site logistics is really, really important. To make that even more sensitive, the highways permits process, the uh, craneage permits, the road closure permits that are necessary to be able to do the installation on the day the panels arrive on site. Typically, we need to give eight weeks notice to the local authority. So the forward planning and programming is so sensitive and so important that it's uh, an, an aspect that needs to be considered beyond what would typically be uh, considered on a, on a retrofit, domestic retrofit project. And the ongoing liaison and communication with all key stakeholders, particularly for that day when the, the panels turn up on site and get installed, is so crucial. And 
clearly that involves the ongoing communication with residents and the, the local residents as well as the tenants of the properties being treated, but also the wider community, including the, the statutory authorities. Just moving on, please, Suzanne. So, as has been said, one of the key differentiators with the Energy Scrum approach is its performance outcome led. Um, and so one of the requirements is that we have to demonstrate the performance in use. To do this, part of the scope of works is to install a full suite of measuring monitoring kit. Um, typically, we've used a system called Carnego, uh, which has been particularly developed to, to satisfy the requirements of Energy Scrum. There's um, other systems that have been developed uh, over the years, but the, the Carnego system is, is very, very focused on uh, the energy sprung criteria and therefore it, it has uh, again evolved over the years and is a very robust approach for us to, to ensure that we're monitoring the performance. What we've been able to do progressively on future phases of schemes is actually bring that together with other monitoring systems. So the energy sprung uh, criteria of energy performance, indoor quality, so we're picking up temperatures, humidity, CO2, um, energy use with lots of uh, submetering and heat metering. All of that data is collected and, and available on the portal to interrogate the, the performance. We're now bringing that together with other systems such as the ACO system that's already uh, being used by many social landlords to, to monitor the fire detection systems and, and, and other in-use uh, conditions. So what we've been able to do through that monitoring is not only be able to demonstrate that it's performing and, and meeting the criteria, but we're able to look at, uh, again, the performance of different solutions and satisfy ourselves that the uh, solutions we're achieving are, are cost effective and, and achieving that sweet spot that uh, Suzanne has already touched on. Very pleasingly and very importantly, the performance gap that is one of the sort of recognised challenges for the industry, the difference between designed performance and actual performance has been addressed from the very outset on these uh, properties and this project and the demonstration of performance in use has, has shown that actually that performance gap is, is not there, that uh, what we're achieving is as designed in, indeed, in, in some cases slightly better than designed. Uh, so, so that's a really important outcome that we found through the monitoring of, uh, of the, the, uh, the properties. And um, the reality is without monitoring, we don't know how the properties and the measures are performing. So we can't learn and we can't evolve and we can't develop our solutions. Uh, just moving on, please, Suzanne. And again, as has already been emphasised by Suzanne and, and John, this isn't all about carbon and energy. This is about addressing the opportunity to deal with the street scene and, and the placemaking. This is about considering what we leave behind uh, for the community. Um, and we've had a real positive reaction to the uh, measures that we've taken on this project. Uh, project on, on these pro properties um, with the, the residents across the board almost uh, without exception uh, taking a great deal of pride in, in the uh, the homes that they, they live in because of the work that's been done improving their, their gardens planting and uh, putting the fencing up uh, improving the internals with decoration and carpet that they, they, they weren't that bothered because the properties were just too cold and, and not very uh, appealing on the outside. So we saw a, a, an immediate uh, change in, in those attitudes uh, to the, the sort of pride and the well-being of the, the residents uh, following the works that we did. Um, and just uh, moving on, Suzanne, there's, a, there's just a few slides of some of the images um, and you can kind of flick through these. We're, we're delighted with the outcome. One of the key uh, stakeholders that uh, was involved in, in the process early on was the local authority planners. And they uh, had a very positive input in terms of thinking about the solution that we could apply here. And they were happy for us to, to make a more transformational impact, make the properties look very different uh, through the intervention rather than where we've experienced in some local authorities, the requirement is to, to try and keep the properties looking the same as uh, the existing condition. So we were fortunate with the, the approach with the planners, but it's a really key uh, stakeholder for maximizing the benefit of retrofit works. If you can carry on just whiz through those. 
for me, Suzanne. And again, we just really can't forget that ultimately what we're doing on any retrofit project is uh, impacting on people's lives and what we do must leave a positive legacy and a positive impact on those people. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Robert, and thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, John, for all presenting and making that really cohesive and clear about the kind of the whole process and, and why you did what you did and all the steps that were there to deliver those fantastic homes. So thank you for sharing with us today. Um, just a reminder to our attendees to put your questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, and if you can, if there is a particular person you wish to answer it, um, please pop their name um, in front of the question as well. That will really help me as a, sort of we chair the, the Q&A section now of this webinar. Um, we'll try and take about 10, 15 minutes to have a kind of conversation together for, for our speakers today to answer those questions. Um, so yeah, so just to, to kick off, we've actually got a question from Jesse Wilde of the Housing Festival, who's our partner in the New Homes and New Ways programme. Um, She's curious about that kind of relationship with the private homes in the street. So how does that retrofit process benefit those private homes, um, either bet insulation either side, potentially of the, the sort of boundary walls? And then second part to her question, um, are the private owners offered a chance to be part of such a retrofit program? And how would those benefits be coll collectively around cost and doing more homes than one per Per time, so yeah, um, I don't know who wants to take that. Is that one for Robert? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, to yeah. jump in. His first thoughts on it. Um, yeah, I mean it's a real shame and, and a real challenge that we can't deal with street by street, and we've got this pepper pot into consider. Um, one of the differences, in fact, in the Netherlands, where the energy strong approach. Uh, was, was evolved uh, is that they don't have the right to buy situation. So they have a whole street terrace that they can improve. Um, and that means that obviously not only in terms of the, uh, the potential cost savings and efficiencies, it does enable that more street scene approach, the, the, the place making to be addressed. Um, so yes, the, the challenge with the private uh, pepper potting is, is a very real one. It impacts on the performance of the treated properties because there's heat losses through uh, the party walls and particularly where there's garages on you know, adjacent properties, that complicates the solution. It means that it's more challenging to, to achieve the outcomes on a, uh, a treated property. Um, the fact is that we've, we've seen a great deal of interest from private landlords that you know, uh, bought these, these properties uh, since the right to buy, uh, as well as owner-occupiers, homeowners, um, once the works have been done, it's, it's still a challenge, though, that many of these uh, homeowners and private landlords uh, really need a, a finance, a funding model that allows them to invest up front. And, and that's the challenge. And there's many local authorities, including Nottingham, for this, this project we're talking about that have tried to put in place low, low cost uh, finance and, and finance that's attached to the properties that, that only needs to be repaid at the point of, of the, uh, the, the owner selling the property. Um, but they've not quite come together. There's been challenges getting those in place. So there's been a great deal of interest from the private owners, particularly when they've seen some of the treated properties. Um, there's a desire for it to become part of the, the work and there's a whole deal of benefits in doing that. But I think the challenge is funding. You were able to do some works to the roofs, though, of the private private homes where they were adjacent. So there was there was re-roofing works that were done as a bonus. Like, so there was some benefit, but yeah, not not as holistic as we'd we'd have liked. I don't know, John, whether there's anything to add on the kind of energy sprung approach or. Uh, well, other than we'd, we'd really it's like a challenge. We'd really like to uh, do whole streets. You know, it's costly to stop and start as you go along that terrace. Um, yeah, same sort of points really. Uh, it, it's um, yeah, uh, pri private households and get getting a package that works for them. Right, I think social landlords can look thirty years uh, at the thirty year business model um I, i'd say private owners 
when it comes to energy measures might only look uh, five or eight years down the line. You know, I don't want to invest in something that uh, the payback's longer than, than than eight years. So, yeah, I I I don't think we've got the quite got the quite the right uh, mix of finance and measures and 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 uh, well developed packages for people to really take that to the private sector at the moment. But absolutely something that that we're looking at. And you know, for industrialization, you need that consistent volume and lower cost projects. So um, yeah, absolutely. We're we're all eyes when it comes to, you know, what's the next move in that space. Yeah. But it sounds like I always say it's it's like trying to keep warm by putting a vest on rather than wearing a coat. That's the you know, it's it's we're always kind of hands are tied by the the tenure. Hmm. But it sounds like Nottingham are looking into it for future projects and how they kind of create the models and packages. So maybe others will sort of look to develop something bespoke for their complicated mixed tenure. Okay, brilliant. Thanks all for answering that. Um, next question from Mark, uh, Mark Southgate around um, the carbon aspect. I don't know, Suzanne, this might be for you to pick up. Um, I think actually, Rob is okay, probably Rob, the best let's, let's send it to Rob. Um, Rob, um, Mark wants to know about assessment of the embodied carbon. You obviously talked about the performance and the operational carbon, but he's wondering pre-project how you look at that decision around demolition versus new build. Yeah. And retrofit, obviously, which you got to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, the, the de facto decision on these properties was actually uh, to consider demolition. So uh, the, the local authority was weighing up that as an option but one of the reasons that they were keen not to is the displacement of the residents the residents like their properties like like the community so so there was a driver to to keep the uh, the residents in in situ um but then there's clearly answering the question uh, a, a significant impact also on embodied carbon de demolition versus you know retention so we have actually done some some energy uh, modeling some uh, life cycle modeling with the University of Nottingham or Nottingham Trent, sorry, um, to, to try and understand the difference of the impact between doing the retrofit that we have done and the alternative of demolition and rebuild. The panels that we've manufactured have been uh, structural timber. So we, we chose timber particularly because of the environmental impact of timber versus alternative materials to, to manufacture the panels. Um, and so Without taking the uh, sequestration of the, the timber, just just uh, looking at the uh, the direct uh, embodied carbon in, in impacts, what we found is that the um, embodied carbon was about sixteen tonne for the whole of the, the works uh, that we undertook. A substantial part of that was actually associated with the PV installation on the roof. Um, and if we look at the carbon savings of the energy in use, it was in the order of about four to five years of payback effectively, if you, if you put it in those terms. So the embodied carbon uh, was substantially different by in the order of 10 times, 15 times at least. It depends what numbers you pull. So, you know, people might cite 120 tonnes of, of carbon uh, on, on a demolition and new build. So effectively, it's yeah several multiples more of demolition and new build versus doing the retrofit for sure and it's just depending on how you calculate and the numbers you use um but importantly we're also interested in understanding if we are doing this intervention is it really sensible in terms of the en energy savings of carbon that we're looking to achieve and that's where we were also interested in how long it takes to, to you know effectively pay back recover that uh, invested carbon and it's in the order of about five years right Thank you. And yeah, Nick was also commenting in the chats around that whole life carbon impacts, which you've obviously been doing. You mentioned Nottingham Trent. And is that something you would typically do on a project now, Robert? Have you seen a change in kind of industry approach and how you do things? There's there's definitely a shift in terms of the focus on embodied carbon, for sure, and, and much more interest in understanding embodied carbon. So, and and the, the the beauty is if we're using offsite solutions like the one that we've adopted on Nottingham, once you've done the initial calculations, then you can actually use that as a baseline, and you can then use that to to modify depending on you know bits that might change. So you you don't have to do a whole calculation every time. 
great. Um, so from Ian Marsh, he was asking as well about that mix of tenure, that local authority homes and the private and the financing. But he was also keen to hear about that, um, the maintenance and repair aspect and discussions with insurance industry about how, how is that managed and maintained, really. So is there something to share on that kind of next step? I think the, the discussions about cost and maintenance are all with the client in this case, because they're all socially rented homes so we go through quite care when we're doing that kind of optioneering we were talking about or what if modeling that's always being built in as well as the cost to the resident it's also thinking about and um, the capital costs also thinking about the maintenance cost and sometimes it's it's around like what product you're choosing and making sure you're picking something that aligns with the rest of the stock or can be you know it's easier to replace the same type of window or like you know a particular heat pump um if they've got other heat pumps installed elsewhere so um and then how it it fits in with other systems so like rob was talking about um on our future project our kind of more current projects so like the carnego monitoring system rather than being kind of a standalone thing like it was on on this example it's then integrated into the aco monitoring system that the local authority already using so we're just trying to get as much out of the solution each time we kind of have another go and improve it. Great, thank you. One, one of the link there, I mean, the reference to insurers is, is, is interesting. Maybe John might comment because the business model with Energy Sprong is, is also about trying to uh, get third party finance and, and long, you know, long term finance, so pension houses and, and such. Um, so, so that's that's a, a key part of the energy performance contracting type model that allows that potential for third party investment to come in to, to fund the, the retrofit works. Um, and I know that uh, that's an ongoing piece of work for the energy strong team. Certainly is, yeah. So, you know, that that business case that we formulate uh, right from the start with the with, between the social landlords and then uh, looking at the particular components of the solution. Um, modeling that over the 30 years to say, when are we going to need to replace components? Um, can we sequence, you know, if, if a landlord's got a particular problem, set of roofs or boilers, you know, can we start to sequence that so that the, the, the payback is, is, is really good? Um, and then, yeah, as, as we're moving off, um, off balance sheet financing, um, looking at, how, you know, how durable is that uh, energy performance what what what's in place to um, uh, maintain that in terms of maintaining uh, batteries or PV systems or or heat pumps? So um, and and now given that we've got uh, in in some cases five years of data and that database that's growing of of, of monitoring of the homes, that's um, uh, really interesting to people looking to finance um, homes over those much longer periods, which is which is what we really need to, to unlock the scale. Yeah, you can back it up with the fact. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, moving on, we've got two questions around the panels, so I'll put those to you. And I think after those two questions, just a bit of kind of final thoughts before we wrap up. Um, so around the panels, Christopher's asking, um, did you find that while making them, you were faced with issues of potential size differences, even if the builds are similar? And is this approach workable on many other different build styles that are slightly more bespoke? Um, Suzanne oh. well I guess like Rob will go into the detail on it but yeah. like the overall I think this is a really exciting approach because essentially like these are archetypes and the houses look the same but they're essentially are all different and so the approach that Melius has developed it maybe is the opposite of like some of the misconceptions of what MMC actually is so it, they are every panel is unique and bespoke and we can use the Melius system to build other types of styles so we've built new build houses as our project in Dermothorpe that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference from the other other houses that are built more traditionally so um, but Rob can fill in the details exciting yeah, to answer yeah absolutely Suzanne and I suppose the only thing that sort of builds on that is where we can where we're doing the surveys we, we always find differences even if the properties look the same there's always differences um, but where we can if we can standardize window sizes simply again for a, an ongoing maintenance and replacement uh, position so the local authority doesn't have to go and measure every window they know what the window sizes are without referencing individual properties then if we can accommodate that then we will sometimes we can't they have to be 
bespoke window sizes, but often we can find that we can we can get a, a terrace of windows or a block of properties with similar size windows uh, to work within the tolerances that we can can build in. Right, and then final question on the panels is around: Did you get any issues with regards to planning and the fact that you're overcladding with those uh, prefab facade panels? So I'd say we had like a really amazing response from planning in Nottingham. It was very strategic. We had some um, some early meetings um, where we, you know, we we described it as a kind of overall design approach. So it, was, it it took account of how many homes we were looking at across the whole city. We we showed what our approach was, and um, you know, met with loads of kind of support and um, sort of politically positive um, and then as a result of that um, they slightly unusually allowed us to only do householder applications for every individual home so it's slightly strange process that was followed here but really which is a much lower level of information than you'd maybe normally do for a full planning application and then there was you know real flexibility in what they allowed so they allowed the residents to pick the colors of their window surrounds and you know brilliantly the first pilot came back like lipstick pink which was you know just really showed the kind of ability to personalize for residents and increase curb appeal so I think it's a really um, positive planning story that we have from Nottingham and as Rob alluded to slightly different to some other areas although I have you know taken planners from say Birmingham visited the Nottingham approach I think when you visit the houses maybe the photos are perhaps a bit more light with whether you like the colours but I think people really understand it when they're in an area with like a lot of repeat house types and can really understand that you're you know creating um, you know which terrace you live in because I live in the green one for instance yeah with a system and a style to it yeah okay great well, thank you so much um we've only got a couple more minutes um I was just quite keen to hear about the factory that was set up so um what's happened with that because obviously that was quite unique to this site and that project um yeah and similarly if people are considering types of projects like this themselves you know obviously a lot of our audience are from the built environment professional community Weeny bit about that would be wonderful if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, so the factory that we set up was in Nottingham. We we worked closely with Nottingham City Council to to find the space, and in fact, it ended up being space that they occupy, they own, uh, that that we share. So we were able to set up the factory very close to the pilot pro project. Um, the principle was that we could create factories, pop-up factories, and we've explored that with other local authorities. That effectively, once we've got the approach and the system sorted, uh, that we can, we can create uh, pop-up factories, new factories, more local to where the, the work is. Clearly, that relies on a, a strong pipeline of work in that area. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, it's replicable. Um, it's something that can, can be uh, put in place uh, based on the, the model that we've now created in Nottingham. Great. Thank you. Such a positive story. So thank you all today for contributing and attending. Um, Suzanne, John, Robert, much appreciate your time to, to contribute to the exhibition and then to the events. Um, and for you, our audience, there's a link there to the seminar next week, which is around uh, steel framing and new homes. So have a look at that. The link's there. That's actually on Tuesday next week. So do sign up and please come and visit the exhibition if you can, if you can make it into central London, new homes and new ways on at the building centre until the 21st of February next year. So thanks again, everyone. Take care and hope to see you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.